This is Duke University. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Eric Myers, director of the Center for Jewish Studies. Welcome, Bruchim Habaim, from all corners of North Carolina and New York and LA <laughs> for our guest speaker. It is a long way and a long time since 1942 when Judah Golden accepted the first appointment in Jewish studies at Duke University some 70 years ago. He was a joint appointment of the Department of Religion and the Divinity School, also called the School of Religion in those days. And his mission was to introduce undergraduates and prospective ministers to Judaism. He went on to finish a distinguished career at Yale and at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm sure many of you know of his distinguished academic accomplishments. You might be thinking, why did he leave Duke? And the late Mutt and Sarah Evans, early supporters of our program, said he had troubles getting kosher food um, in Durham and that the Jewish community was not um, what he had hoped it might be. But I think times have changed since the 40s. 70 years is a special number in the Hebrew Bible. The prophet Jeremiah predicting 70 years of exile and God's anger in Jeremiah 25 and 29. And Zechariah the prophet also uses the number in chapters 1 and chapter 7 three times. He designates there the maximum length of God's anger. I hope God's anger has subsided by now. As for the 40 years, as in the founding of our Duke program some 30 years after Ju Judah Golden came here, I should like to note that our first five years were conducted jointly with UNC Chapel Hill. When at the end of that period, UNC made its first appointment about 1978 or so, we each went our separate ways, and I ha hasten to say that today, we are slowly coming back together in several significant ways. First, we may point to the successful Duke UNC seminar series, Sunday afternoon, and second, to the joint graduate certificate program, which will be launched this fall. The robust years of enrollments in the 1970s through the 1990s have given way at Duke and many other research universities in the new millennium to a serious decline in the valuation of the humanities, and we hope to overcome this disturbing trend. Scholarship and teaching remain at the core of the mission of Jewish studies today, and the situation of Israel is at the center of all Jewish concern and remains the fulcrum of all that we do, no matter what one's perspective on the politics may be. More recently, our library fellowship program with a focus on human rights in the Marshall Meyer and A.J. Heschel archival holdings and on Jewish art in the Kanoff collection has become a major activity of the center. And we are currently seeking more support so that that program can continue to flourish. We are especially grateful to our donors, past and present, who allow us to do so much for our students and for the public. We are especially grateful to the Rudnick family, David and Gail, here tonight from New York and Florida, who through their good auspices of their endowment are primarily responsible for bringing our distinguished speaker here tonight, Rabbi David Ellenson. I want to bring to your attention to the program that follows our lecture, food and drink, and a special toast, and the privilege of seeing the special exhibit, Collecting Matisse and Modern Masters, the Cone Sisters of Baltimore. And I'm happy to announce that our good friend Ben Cohn, here in the front row from the grandnephew of the Cone Sisters, Cone Sisters, is here for this special occasion. Ben, mazel tov to you. <clears throat> I wish I had a crystal ball so that I could tell you what the future will look like here on campus and in the Middle East and in Israel. 
But for now, completing my 44th year here at Duke at this great university, I can say that the Center for Jewish Studies is in good hands, and I am certain that it will remain a faithful custodian of the Jewish heritage in perpetuity. I would also like to see a closer relationship with the Freeman Center for Jewish Life, which so many faculty helped to create. Without further ado, I present to you Laura Lieber, uh, Assistant Director of the Program in Jewish Studies, a former student of Rabbi Ellenson, who will introduce our guest. Good evening. In some ways, Professor David Ellenson is very easy to introduce. Rabbi Ellenson is president and IH and Anna Grancell professor of Jewish religious thought at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, my beloved alma mater. He is a distinguished rabbi, scholar, and leader of the reform movement in the US and abroad, and internationally recognized for his publications and research in the areas of Jewish religious thought, ethics, and modern Jewish history. Professor Ellenson, who was born in Brookline and grew up in Newport News, received his undergraduate degree from the College of William and Mary. I hope you heard that, Ben. From which he holds an honorary doctorate, his PhD from Columbia University, and his rabbinic ordination from HUC, the institution he now heads. He's been a fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute of Jerusalem, a fellow and lecturer at the Institute for Advanced Studies, and a Lady Davis Visiting Professor of the Humanities in the Department of Jewish Thought at Hebrew University. He's been a visiting professor at both UCLA and the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, and in every instance, both as a scholar and a leader, from the pulpit, the lectern, and the podium, Professor Ellenson has worked to build bridges without compromising principles. Rabbi Ellenson's extensive publications include, and you can find these in the program for this evening as well, Tradition and Transition, Orthodoxy, Halakha, and the Boundaries of Modern Jewish History, Rabbi Esriel Hildsheimer and the Creation of Modern Jewish Orthodoxy, which was nominated for the National Jewish Book Council's Award for Outstanding Book in Jewish History. Between Tradition and Culture, the Dialectics of Jewish Religion and Identity in the Modern World, and After Emancipation, Jewish Religious Responses to Modernity, which won the National Jewish Book Council's Award for Outstanding Book in Jewish Thought. His most recent work, Pledges of Jewish Allegiance, Conversion, Law, and Policymaking in 19th and 20th Century Orthodox Responsa, co-authored with Daniel Gordas of the University of Judaism, came out earlier this year with Stanford University Press. All of this is absolutely true and available to anyone who wants to do diligent research on the internet. But this list of schools, awards, and publications hardly captures the warm, generous, and deeply humane teacher, mentor, scholar, and mensch that I've been privileged to know over the years since a kala in Beloit, Wisconsin, where we experienced something rivaling Noah's flood together when I was a student intern and could never have foreseen myself standing here in this august auditorium offering these introductory remarks. Professor Ellenson is the president of an institution, a unique institution that spans four campuses, Los Angeles, Cincinnati, New York, and Jerusalem, and programs ranging from rabbinical and cantorial training to nonprofit management and ancient Near Eastern studies, perhaps the ultimate in nonprofit work. <laughs> <laughs> and yet I think he knows all of the students on all four campuses by name. He knows where we want to go and what we want to do when we get there. He cares not only what we are doing, but how we are. And, he knows, and as he knows us, he's let us come to know him. He is, in short, not merely the Rosh Yeshiva, the head of the academy, but our rabbi, too. And despite all his obligations, duties, responsibilities, and jobs, all of his traveling and speaking as the public face of the largest mo Jewish movement of North America through some of the most turbulent but exciting times in recent memory, he not only responds personally to his email, but manages, I dare not ask how, to continue a rich life of scholarship as well. It is a model that I, as a rabbi and PhD, hope to emulate. Professor Ellenson's particular place in the Jewish world affords him unique and important perspectives on Jewish life in the modern state of Israel. His insights into this complex culture and its interactions with our own far from simple society will be the topic of tonight's lecture, Jewish Peoplehood in the Jewish State, marriage, conversion, and the future of Israel. 
This is a most fitting topic for the second night of Hanukkah, a holiday deeply textured by conflicting convictions about Jewish identity and ideals, but one which also affirms the potency of delicate flames against darkness. Please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Rabbi David Ellenson. Erev Tov, V'chag Hanukkah Sameach. Good evening, and uh, hope everybody has a joyful holiday tonight. I'm grateful for all these introductions and delighted to be here. I'm especially happy that uh, members of my extended family, the Andrews and Silvermans, are here from a foreign city called Raleigh. Uh, they migrated from Virginia, but they, uh, they made it here tonight. Uh, my friend, Rabbi Chavivi, uh, who came here all the way from uh, Greensboro tonight with his congregants, very, very appreciative. His brother uh, and sister-in-law are really among our closest friends in the world, and therefore, by extension, he is as well, and certainly Rabbi Friedman and many other people. Uh, one gentleman came up to me tonight earlier. As Laura said, I grew up in Newport News, Virginia, though I was born in Brookline, Mass. I will at least make a comment about that that may relate to issues of Jewish identity. All four of my grandparents were immigrants uh, to this country. They came from Eastern Europe. Uh, my maternal grandparents ended up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They lived on uh, Hancock Street, right between Harvard and Central Squares. Uh, my paternal grandparents ended up coming in through Baltimore. They migrated southward and lived in Newport News. My dad lived in Newport News his entire life, uh, except for during World War II, after he graduated from the College of William and Mary. Uh, these are remarks before I really begin to speak. Uh, but I feel I have to explain the geography of uh, the kind introduction that Laura provided. My um, father uh, was in the service during World War II. And then after World War II, he attended Harvard Law School, where he met my mother. They met in 1946 at Harvard Hillel. My maternal grandmother, and this will relate to issues of Jewish identity, patrilineal, matrilineal descent, would actually not initially allow the engagement, saying that she had never heard of a Jew from Virginia. Uh, <laughs> so much for patrilineality and determination of Jewish identity. For my Bubby Stern, Virginia was, as it were, uh, not kosher. Uh, you mentioned Judah Golden before. In any event, uh, my mother at the time said, well, how could he not be Jewish? I met him at Hillel. He knows how to daven. He keeps kosher. He speaks Yiddish. And you can look at my face, and you can imagine. Uh, and my grandmother in Cambridge said, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> said, the boys at Harvard are very smart. He may just want a Jewish girl. <laughs> Until I meet his mother, there's no engagement. In those years, it took 18 hours on the train to get from Tidewater, the peninsula, up to Boston. My Bubby Ellenson disembarked in North Station in Boston. I'll only say she looked like an Eastern European Jewish immigrant woman. My other grandmother took one look at her, turned to my mother, said, is that Sam's mother? And said, well, it must be. They're speaking Yiddish. They're kissing. Uh, said, OK, the engagement's on. And uh, a year later, they were married. A year after that, I was born during my dad's last year of law school. And then he came back, uh, came back to the South. I also am greatly appreciative uh, that Laura introduced me tonight. It is true that, uh, my gosh, well over a dozen years ago, 15 years ago or so, we worked on a uh, retreat together. And Laura was still in rabbinical school at Hebrew Union College at that point. And uh, we knew that she had the kind of promise that would ultimately bring her to the University of Chicago, where she earned her doctoral degree and uh, Middlebury College before coming here to Duke. So I'm really very honored that you asked me to be here tonight and delighted to uh, speak with you. My last comment will be that uh, I noted that last year the Rudnick Lecture was delivered by uh, my very good friend Arnie Eisen, who's the chancellor of 
JTS. Some of you may be aware that on Hanukkah there was a debate in the Talmud between the House of Shammai and the House of Hillel as to how one ought to light the Hanukkah candles. Beit Shammai, the House of Shammai, said that you should light eight on the first night and then you would reduce a candle each night, whereas Beit Hillel said that, no, you need to light one candle each night and you increase in holiness, so you add another candle for each night. We follow uh, that practice uh, to this day, and the rabbinic phrase that's associated with it is, ma'alim ba'kodesh ve'en moridin, one goes up in holiness and never descends. Uh, you can relate this to my friend Chancellor Eisen of the Jewish <laughs> Theological Seminary, our conservative uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, it is quite clear with the Rudnick Lecture, and it is appropriate then that we're holding it on Hanukkah, that uh, it is clear that in keeping with this rabbinic dictum, one goes up, ascends in holiness, and never descends. You've invited the president of the leading reform institution after the conservative institution uh, earlier on. So very, very appreciative to know that tradition is observed this way at uh, Duke University. I won't make any more comments in that regard. Let me also say that in regard to the topic tonight, I will genuinely confess that when we discussed this topic, and I had just completed writing a book with Daniel Gordas uh, on issues of conversion and have done uh, a fair amount, indeed a great deal of study on modern writings on Geirut, on conversion uh, in Eastern Europe, Western and Central Europe, North America, and Israel, uh, that this is sort of what led me to this topic tonight as an aspect of uh, issues relating to Israel. I will confess that had I known when we set this topic of the events of the last month that indeed I might have spoken in a different vein, but given the uh, diversity of opinions that people have politically about different events in Israel, maybe it's nice to talk about a non-controversial topic like reform conservative orthodox relations uh, and internal, uh, internal Jewish politics. But let me try to talk about why I do think that this issue of conversion is significant. And I would like to say that when you look at different rabbis' writings on conversion, and as I introduce this topic tonight, there is a narrow and a broader way to look at this topic. In the narrow sense, what I will be discussing to some degree are political structures in Israel in relationship to Jewish status and identity, political structures, but in addition, uh, in that sense too, narrow kinds of legal rulings, case law, as we would call it in Western jurisprudence, Biske Din, Jewish legal rulings in a narrow sense and how laws of conversion are interpreted based on the sources of Jewish tradition by, large, by given rabbis. The larger question that will really emerge from the different opinions and stances that different rabbis in the state of Israel take deal genuinely with the larger question of how is it that one conceptualizes Jewish peoplehood. And to some degree tonight, what we will see is that how the state of Israel internally will ultimately come to deal with this issue uh, will have a great deal to say about how it is that we as Jews in the modern world come to understand what does it mean to be part of Am Yisrael, what does it mean to be part of the Jewish people. Let me begin before I move to Israel with just a brief, brief description of Jewish laws of status and identity. Uh, and by the way, here I would like to also make another distinction. Status genuinely refers or generally refers to the legal status that someone possesses. Status is a much more objective form of terminology than identity. How one may feel about himself or herself may be completely irrelevant to the political status that an individual has, whereas identity has a great deal to do with how individual people perhaps look upon a given individual and regard them, how that person regards himself or herself. Prior to the advent of the modern world, questions of status and identity usually overlapped in regard to Jews and Judaism. That is to say that prior to the advent of the modern world, when Jews lived in a world that was marked by a corporate structure, 
A modern notion of individual identity and the ability to determine one's identity individually what was in effect genuinely non-existent. There was virtually no dissonance between the private and communal realms of how an individual would define him or herself and how the larger world might view them. To just give an illustration of the difference between status and identity, you could have, and now I'm making up a name, a woman named Sarah Cohen. Um, if a woman named Sarah Cohen, at least in my childhood, were to introduce herself to me, and let me ask you, what would you presume she was? Yeah, you would presume she was Jewish. It's a biblical first name, certainly a Jewish surname, it may well be, and undoubtedly would be true, that there would be some Jewish ancestry, I would imagine, if the last name was Cohen. But you have to also keep in mind that Sarah Cohen could have a non-Jewish mother and a Jewish father. From the standpoint of classical rabbinic tradition, a person becomes Jewish in one of two ways. They're either born of a Jewish mother, there is a notion of a birth dogma in classical Jewish identity, namely, has nothing to do with voluntarism whatsoever or how one would view oneself. Rather, if you were born of a Jewish mother, from the standpoint of classical Jewish law, you are Jewish, or you are permitted to convert to Judaism. If Sarah Cohen had a non-Jewish mother and a Jewish father, prior to the advent of the modern world, her halachic status would be that of a non-Jew. But you might even find a Sarah Cohen with that surname who might have had Jewish ancestry who would never have been raised Jewishly at all and might not, in fact, regard herself in any way as Jewish, despite the fact that many Jews and non-Jews would view such a person as a Jew, regardless of how she were, let's say, to view herself. Conversely, conversely, you could have a woman named Sarah Levinson, born of a non-Jewish mother and a Jewish father, uh, who was converted to Judaism, let's say, by a conservative rabbi. From the standpoint of Orthodox Judaism, that person's status as a Jew would still not be fixed. Because from an Orthodox standpoint, the only conversions that would be valid are conversions conducted under Orthodox rabbinic auspices. And you should know in the Orthodox world, those conversions are only valid when they are valid. That is to say, <laughs> there are times where Orthodox rabbis will reject conversions conducted even by other Orthodox rabbis, but I won't get into all the details of that at the moment. But in order to understand the difference between status and identity, keep in mind you could have a woman, Sarah Cohen, whose mother was converted to Judaism with a mikvah, with Jewish ritual bath, baptism, in accord with Jewish law, who would be regarded then by non-Jews and by every element of the Jewish community as Jewish, she would have, in fact, Jewish status and Jewish identity, except that there would be one group that might not regard her as halakhically Jewish, and that would be an Orthodox group, because her mother would not have been converted under Orthodox auspices. So I want you to keep in mind, as I deal with this topic tonight, there are differences between status and identity, and this is where peoplehood will also come in. As we investigate this topic tonight, the way in which different rabbis and authorities in the state of Israel will deal with this issue will also tell you a great deal about conceptions of Jewish peoplehood. So that when Danny Gordis and I began our book, we started uh, with the true incident in Israel, which is unfortunately all too common. There was a young man born of a Russian Jewish father and a non-Jewish Russian mother who made Aliyah, immigrated to Israel. The young man grew up in Israel, served in the Israel Defense Forces, and died in the defense of the state of Israel. When it came time for him to be buried, as I'm going to describe in a moment, Jewish cemeteries in Israel are controlled by the chief rabbinate, which is under Orthodox auspices. They did not allow his burial as a Jew in the state of Israel, though he had participated in the fate and destiny of the Jewish people and had even given his life to actually uh, protect the very same rabbis and in their institutions who did not regard him as being sufficiently Jewish to have a Jewish burial. He was subsequently, in this one case, uh, buried in a special cemetery in Israel reserved for individuals of his type of status but you can begin to see that the opinions that rabbis will issue on these questions 
tell a great deal about how it is that individuals view Jewish peoplehood. And I will get to a rabbi named Chaim Amsalem, A-M-S-A-L-E-M, trying to spell it so you'll get it right for the final exam, uh, who has a different view than most Orthodox rabbis in Israel, or certainly those empowered in regard to this issue. So let me now go to the state of Israel itself, having talked about issues of status and identity, and to keep in mind then that from a classical halachic standpoint, there are two ways in which one has Jewish status born of a Jewish mother or converted to Judaism with an Orthodox bed din, which from a formal halakhic standpoint, I would even say, Jewish legal standpoint, means that an individual who was non-Jewish and therefore was obligated to observe under Jewish law seven Noahide commandments, which are basic moral laws required of all humankind in Jewish tradition. Remember that the first covenant that God makes in the Jewish Bible is with all of humankind through Noah, Genesis chapter 9, so that from a Jewish standpoint, God stands in covenantal relationship with all human beings. In Jewish religious tradition, this is referred to as the Noahide covenant, because what religion was Noah not? Not a trick question. What was he not? He's not Jewish. Noah, Abraham, and Sarah, the first Jews. Noah was not Jewish. The Noahide covenant reflects the fact that God, from a Jewish religious standpoint, according to the Bible, stands in covenantal relationship with all humankind. As the Talmud interprets this, and you have the sign of the rainbow that symbolizes that covenant, all persons are required to observe seven commandments to deal with murder, theft, incest, etc. They're opposed to them all. They don't support them. Uh, <laughs> A Jew, in contrast, is from a standpoint of halakha, theoretically required to observe how many commandments? 613. So conversion from this standpoint and Jewish peoplehood consists of observance of commandments, and it means that an individual who was formerly obligated to observe seven commandments is now obligated to observe 613. But keep in mind that Identity itself may be far broader than this. So if we take our Russian young man a moment ago, born of a Jewish father, non-Jewish mother, grows up in Israel, speaks Hebrew, fights in defense of the Jewish state, certainly many Jews from a sociological and cultural standpoint would regard such an individual as Jewish. Again, status and identity are distinct. Now we move to the state of Israel. On November 29th, 1947, Kuftet November, the United Nations votes to partition Palestine, and in May of 1948, the Jewish state is created. When the state is created, one of the decisions that David Ben-Gurion, who was the prime minister, made, and this has to do with Israeli coalition politics, this may be a little bit like bringing coals to Newcastle. I cannot imagine that many people here are not aware of this. But in Israel, you have a proportional representation system in the Knesset, in the parliament. Whichever party has a plurality of votes makes coalitions with minority parties to give them a majority so that they can govern. There are 120 seats. If you win, and there is only a national electorate, there are no local districts, if you win one 120th of the votes, you get one seat in the Knesset, your party. It is a system that is designed to have political parties proliferate. The two major parties when the State of Israel were created, one was led by uh, Menachem Begin, and the other was led by David Ben-Gurion. They disagreed over issues of finance, foreign policy, Ben-Gurion, in order to create a majority in the Knesset from the very beginning, needed 16 votes that were supplied then by the National Religious Party. He had 46 seats in the first Knesset. This gave him a majority. And the Religious Party wanted control basically only over a few things. And otherwise, on issues of foreign policy, domestic policy, in all sorts of other areas, they allowed Ben-Gurion to have hegemony so that he agreed to this. The, issue, the areas that he agreed to was that he continued 
to affirm a system that had been set up by the British in pre-state periods in regard to issues of personal status and identity. For issues of personal status and identity, marriage, divorce, burial, these would continue to be under the aegis of every religious community in Israel. If you were Christian, no civil marriage. You had to be married by Christian ministers recognized by the state. If you were Muslim, it meant an imam. If you were Jewish, it meant a rabbi. But the rabbinate that was recognized was the institution of the chief rabbinate, which had been established by the British during the mandate period. So I want to be clear, Ben-Gurion made no novel moves in this regard. He simply continued to allow the Orthodox and this chief rabbinate to have hegemony, complete hegemony and a complete monopoly over issues of Jewish status and identity, marriage, conversion, divorce, and burial in the Jewish state. Remember, too, that the state of Israel was largely created Jewishly by Jews who came either from Eastern Europe, where they knew nothing of reform or conservative or liberal branches of Judaism, or Jews like the Chavivi family who came from Edot to Mizrach, from Yemen, from the Middle East, from Morocco, who also knew nothing of liberal Judaism. So it is important to remember for an American audience that when we talk about the state of Israel, Israel was founded by Jews who knew virtually nothing about Jewish religious life as it is organized in the United States of America. Ben-Gurion agreed to maintain this orthodox hegemony over these areas because he felt that it was simply not significantly important enough to have a fight over as he was striving to create a state. He also agreed that very orthodox rabbinic students, this is just another matter, very orthodox rabbinic students could continue to study in yeshivot and they would receive state support. When he agreed to this, there were about 10,000 Jews who were engaged in such study. Today, there are about 500,000 who are engaged in such study who actually do not engage in, uh, in gainful employment. The state supports a class of 500,000 students, uh, it's probably as good as a fellowship at Duke University if you're in, uh, if you're in graduate school. Ben-Gurion also did this because he himself believed that orthodoxy and Jewish traditionalism were destined to die. He himself was a complete secularist. Ben-Gurion was not even married, he and his wife Paula, by a rabbi. They were married by a civil magistrate David Ben-Gurion and his wife Paula when he was on a visit to New York in 1916. He had no rabbi officiate at his wedding. He established this procedure. What is interesting about it in retrospect, and I'll get to this in the main part of uh, my lecture as it goes on tonight, he himself ultimately uh, had to confront some of the implications of this decision in his own family. His son fought for the British during World War II in a Jewish regiment. He was wounded. While he was recovering in the hospital, could maybe make a movie of this and I don't know, have June Jones uh, star in it, uh, he fell in love with his nurse. There was only one catch given that it was David Ben-Gurion's son. What do you think that catch might be? She was not Jewish. She was a Scottish Presbyterian. She converted to Judaism in London. The rabbi was Joachim Prinz, who was a refugee rabbi at the time from Germany, living in London, later became head of the World Jewish Congress. Rabbi Prinz conducted the conversion. So she converted to Judaism with a mikvah. And uh, he then performed the wedding. They came back and lived in Israel on Kibbutz de Boker. They were blessed with little junior Ben-Gurions, and one was David Ben-Gurion's granddaughter. 
She grew up in Kibbutz De Boker, a secular kibbutz in the Negev, right near Beersheba. Spoke Hebrew, served in the Israeli military, and then she was about to be, because she met a fellow soldier in the army, uh, she wanted to be engaged and be married. She went to the Rabbanut in Haifa. This was in the late 1960s. She went to the Rabbanut in Haifa uh, to get a marriage license. What's the catch here, though? Her mother was not converted by an Orthodox rabbi. Now you have the granddaughter of David Ben-Gurion, as it were, the George Washington of the Jewish state, grows up in Israel, lives there her entire life, serves in the Israel Defense Forces, speaks Hebrew. In light of status and identity, from the standpoint of all non-Orthodox rites of Judaism, she would even have Jewish status. If you would ask her, was she Jewish, she would have certainly said yes. And most people in the larger world would have viewed the granddaughter of the prime minister of the Jewish state who speaks Hebrew and grows up in Israel on Kibbutz De Boker, most non-Jews, I believe, would identify her as a Jew. But there was one group that would not give her that status, and they just happened to be in charge of who was able to be married and not be married in Israel. Uh, what did happen in this case, she applied for a marriage license. She was rejected. And a little bit like, I think it was Animal Farm, all animals are equal, but some animals are a little more equal than others. She was, I will tell you, taken the very next day after she was uh, refused a marriage license, she, she was taken by an Orthodox group of rabbis to a mikvah. She immersed herself in one day, uh, and she was then defined as Jewish. A marriage license was delivered to her, and I suspect David Ben-Gurion was able to dance the hora at her uh, <laughs> wedding. Uh, so there is an irony in this. Now, to make the situation a little more complex in regard to Jewish peoplehood, the state of Israel also, when it was established, was established for several reasons. One, of course, was that it would become a Merkaz Ruchani, a spiritual center of Jewish culture for Jews everywhere in the world, the vision of Achad Ha'am, the great Zionist thinker. But the other point of creating the state of Israel, to which all of us are still extremely, extremely sensitive, is that Israel would become a place of refuge and defense for Jews throughout the world. After all, as one looks at the history of the Jewish people, and if one were to certainly consider the Shoah, the Holocaust, uh, just because we Jews are often paranoid doesn't mean that sometimes people aren't really out to get us. Uh, there was a need for Israel to provide protection for Jews throughout the world. If I could put it in the crassest terms, the state of Israel and its creation, as Jews now would have political autonomy and power, meant, and this is a crass way of putting it, that the cost of killing Jews would escalate over what it had been in the 1930s and 40s. Jews simply could not be killed with impunity, as was true in Europe in the 1930s and 40s. As a result, the state of Israel in early 1950 created a chok hashlut, a law of return. For purposes of the law of return, Jewish status was defined differently than it would be by the rabbinate. For purposes of the law of return, anyone born of a Jewish mother, anyone converted to Judaism under any rabbinic auspices, and in fact, anyone who had even one Jewish grandparent, for purposes of the law of return, is considered Jewish. So if Rabbi Chavivi or Rabbi Friedman perform a conversion, that individual is permitted to immigrate, if they so choose immediately, to live in the state of Israel and to be given immediate status as a Jewish citizen in the state of Israel under the law of return. In fact, even if there were not a conversion and you have one Jewish grandparent, you are given immediate status as a Jew legally in the state of Israel because the state of Israel exists in some measure to see to it that a Jew will never be citizenless again. 
All one has to do is think about the voyage of the damned. To be stateless means that you potentially, potentially can simply be executed. As a result, the law of return was created and stands at the very center of the ideology that informs the Jewish state that no Jew should ever have to fear that she or he will not have the protection of the law and the protection of a sovereign nation to secure their personhood, their safety, their security. What this means in large measure then, what this means in large measure is that you can have individuals who move to Israel, are granted citizenship as Jews in the state of Israel, so that if I take my fictitious, and I don't know, there may well be real people, converts from Rabbi Chavivi or Rabbi Friedman who make Aliyah, immigrate to Israel, they're given every right that any other Jew would be given in the state of Israel in terms of privileges, uh, financial support. However, if they wanted to be married in the state of Israel, or frankly buried in a Jewish cemetery in the state of Israel, there might well be, in fact, there would be a problem if it were known. Because those issues are controlled by whom? By the Orthodox rabbinate. It is difficult I think sometimes for Americans to understand this completely because there is, as it were, a kind of dissonance or disjunction between the law of return and hegemony, monopoly, control, autonomy over issues of Jewish burial, conversion, and divorce in the Jewish state. By and large, while those of us who are in, let's say, the non-Orthodox rabbinate are not always happy about this, for most of the years in the state of Israel, these issues have not been ones of primary concern. Part of the reason is that the number of individuals who have been personally impacted by this <clears throat> remain relatively few. And when there have been cases where Jewish law is deemed as problematic by the larger Israeli public, there have usually been ad hoc, but not principled solutions to these issues. So for example, well, there's a gigantic difference in resolving the two. One issue, and it does reflect issues of Jewish peoplehood as well, but for example, you have a very famous case. It's like everything when an academic states it. It's famous if you happen to know about it. Uh, but it involved a brother and sister named Langer. There were two children born to a couple uh, in Israel, the two children were named Hanoch and Miriam Langer. They were brother and sister. Mrs. Langer, and this was a case that almost caused the government of the state of Israel to topple. And this is where peoplehood will come in. <laughs> when you think of all the issues that the Jewish people in the world have to confront, uh, but these are very serious issues in Israel. My favorite case, this is what we're going to call a uh, little bit of an aside. I hope it will be somewhat interesting. What I really love, in the 1860s, one of my favorite cases in New Orleans, Louisiana, children born to a non-Jewish mother, Jewish father. The war between the states, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people killing each other, but the Jews in New Orleans knew what was really important. Can children born to a non-Jewish mother and a Jewish father have a brit milah conducted by a moel? This is what they're fighting about while the civil war is going on. The rabbi says no, they're born to a non-observant Jewish father. A Christian mother, the boys cannot be circumcised. This is what America means when you don't have the state involved in these issues. One moel said, well, I can't perform the circumcisions. The rabbi forbade it. The other moel, and Mr. Goldenberg, said, I don't care. The rabbi forbade it. Give me my uh, kosher corned beef for breakfast. I'll do the 
circumcision the next day, and the, uh, the rabbi did do the circumcision. One rabbi did favor the circumcision, and he said, we should bring these children in. Mi yodea, yodea Yisrael. How do you know? If you bring these children in, a great leader of the Jewish people may sprout from among them. I try to cite that on different occasions. In any event, you have this case of the Langers. Mrs. Langer had been married to a man, and try to follow this. It's, it, it isn't really that difficult, but it, is, it has more than one detail. Uh, Mrs. Langer had been married to a man who had been a Polish Catholic who converted to Judaism, who converted to Judaism in Poland and married Mrs. Langer. I, the, the name was actually Bonkowski. We will just call him Mr. Polak for purposes of a public lecture. Mr. Polak, Mr. Pole, converts to Judaism and marries the woman who later becomes Mrs. Langer. She believes that her husband has died in the Holocaust. She goes to Israel and marries Mr. Langer. How many of you know this case? This case virtually destroyed the political structure of the state of Israel. Suddenly, in the early 1950s, the first husband shows up in Israel. It is like the return of Martin Gare. <laughs> but what is the problem from a Jewish legal standpoint now? From a Jewish legal standpoint, the issue then of mamzerut, how would you translate what's a mamzer? A bastard, yes. There are a lot of mamzerim in the world. In Yiddish, the term is used in a colloquial sense to refer to not such a nice person. But it's a bad translation to call a mamzer a bastard. Because in American or Western law, a mamzer is someone born of an ad uh, out of wedlock. That is not the case in Jewish law. In Jewish law, a mamzer, an illegitimate person, is someone born either from an incestuous union or in the case of a woman where the woman is an adulteress. So I won't get into this all tonight, but I will tell you that uh, Judaism, classical rabbinic Judaism, and I turn to my friends who are scholars here, they know far more about it than I do. I would not say that gender equality is a value that is inherent in classical rabbinic <laughs> tradition. It's not really a matrilineally oriented religious tradition. It tends to be patrilineal. So if you have a single Jewish woman who has an adulterous relationship with a married Jewish man, the tradition does not recommend this. But if it happens, the child is not illegitimate. If a married Jewish woman has relations with anyone other than her husband, the child is illegitimate. Why is this now a problem in regard to the Langers, their children? Remember, Mrs. Langer was married. She thought her husband had died. She was then remarried in Israel on the assumption that the first husband was dead. And then he now shows up. What does that do to the status of the children? The children are now illegitimate. They are mumzerim because the wife genuinely was an aguna, a chained woman who was not free to marry. Three times Israeli rabbinic courts ruled on the conversion of Mrs. Langer's first husband. And in every instance, the court ruled that his conversion was valid and he was Jewish. The government of the state of Israel, with its coalition politics, depending on the Orthodox, was about to collapse. Most Israelis have no idea about these laws, none. Because most Israelis, particularly then, are completely secular. They don't know anything about these laws. What they did know, and this deals with issues of Jewish peoplehood, 
is that this young man and young woman who had met other Israelis and had served in the Israeli Defense Forces were part of the Jewish people and a basic human right was being denied them. They were not being allowed to be married in the state of Israel. Rabbi Shlomo Gorin, who was then the chief rabbi of the army, convened what to this day remains a secret bet din, a secret rabbinical court. We do not know to this day who sat on the court, but Rabbi Gorin issued a public ruling in which he ruled that the conversion of the first husband was invalid. Why is that significant? And why does that provide, I'm going to put this in Merchaot, I'll use a little Hebrew, in, <laughs> very little, uh, in quotes, why does that provide a solution to the problem? Because then, from the standpoint of classical Jewish law, there is no such thing as intermarriage. You can only be married. Kiddushin only can obtain between two Jews. Ein Kiddushin Tosin. This means that Mrs. Langer was really never married to her first husband. As a result, she was not an aguna, a chained woman. And she therefore had the right to marry Mr. Langer. And the stigma of illegitimacy of Mamze Root was then removed from the children. This averted what might have been in 1971-72 a great crisis in Israel where the government might have toppled because the Israeli public would not tolerate the idea given its own conception of Jewish peoplehood, where these children shared in the fate and destiny of the Jewish people as Israeli Jews, they would not tolerate this right being denied this young man and this young woman. Rabbi Gorin resolved the problem. At the time, the dean of the law school at Tel Aviv University was Amnon Rubinstein. Dean Rubinstein at that point wrote an op-ed in an Israeli newspaper who said, this is a great example of where the solution the cure is worse than the illness because Rabbi Gorin then established a precedent and I want to indicate for good reasons from a legal standpoint, from a legal standpoint, this was driven by a policy consideration and it made for actually very bad law because what Rabbi Gorin did was he took testimony against the first husband, not in his presence, did not reveal who the court was, ruled that he was not an observant Jew, and therefore the promise that he made to observe Jewish law when he converted 35 years earlier must not have been genuinely valid. He must not have really meant it. And therefore, he engaged in what today we call bitula gerut lamafreya. He, as it were, retroactively annulled the conversion on the basis of the fact that after the conversion, he was not completely observant. By the way, he was not allowed to give testimony at the trial himself to refute the charges against him. Rabbi Gorin had a problem. He had to get this boy and girl married. The Israeli public, by the way, applauded it. One headline, I was living in Israel at the time that I loved in, I don't know, Yediot Achronot or Ma'ariv, one of the Israeli papers, an ultra-Orthodox rabbi, there was a headline in the paper said of Rabbi Gorin, Hoyoter Garua me Rav Reformi. He's worse than a reform rabbi. I still have that headline. It makes our Samicha worth a great, great deal, uh, is what I would say. You have these ironies that emerge, and now I want to fast forward so we'll have some time for questions and answers. Because what you need to understand here is that Israel, there are tremendous complexities over this issue internally, and it reflects a great deal of issues of Jewish peoplehood, because what also begins to happen is that in the 1970s, but even more in the 80s and 90s, you begin to get a huge Russian aliyah to Israel. The chief rabbi of Israel in the 1970s, Isser Unterman, issued lots of halakhic rulings that were very lenient on conversion because he wanted to incorporate these people and give them Jewish status within the Jewish state. In the 1990s and today, there are probably 500,000 people descended from this Russian aliyah 
who live as Jews in the state of Israel, who speak Hebrew, who serve in the Israeli army, but who do not have halachic status as Jews. So they are not permitted to be married, buried, uh, or divorced in the Jewish state. There is no alternative for them because there is no civil marriage in Israel. What this has meant is that, ironically, if you look at current Israeli politics, while Prime Minister Netanyahu and Foreign Minister Lieberman have joined forces because of their common stances on foreign policy questions, Foreign Minister Lieberman's political party, which is composed principally of Russian Jews, very much wants to change this law because his own constituents, by and large, cannot be married in the state of Israel. The reason why this will come to be a significant issue as we move ahead, politics makes strange bedfellows. Lieberman is with, so to speak, many of the ultra-Orthodox forces on foreign policy questions. But on this issue, the very same people whom he empowers and who are empowered in Israel deny members of his own party the right to be married, buried, or divorced in the state of Israel. In addition, the chief rabbinate itself in recent years has been taken over by, I'm not even sure ultra-Orthodox is the precise term, I would say the most stringent interpreters of Jewish law in Jewish history on issues of status, identity, uh, and conversion. For many years, from the 1990s, the person who was in charge of conversion in Israel, the Orthodox rabbi, was a rabbi named Rabbi Druckmann. Rabbi Druckmann is a national Zionist figure, and he took rather lenient, broad, inclusive stances in regard to conversion. And he allowed the conversion of people who wanted to come into Judaism, even when they were not completely, completely observant of all the details of Jewish law. Over 15,000 people converted to Judaism in Israel under the aegis or auspices of Rabbi Druckmann. In 2007 and beyond, there were several challenges to the validity of Rabbi uh, Druckmann's conversions. I don't even want to get into the details of some of the cases, but the bottom line is the head of the high rabbinical court in Israel, who had more power politically than Rabbi Druckmann, Rabbi Avram Sherman, retroactively annulled all the conversions conducted by Rabbi Druckmann, saying that converts, and this is the conception of peoplehood, a Jew is someone who observes 613 commandments. If you have a Jew who lives in Israel, participates in the fate and destiny of the Jewish state, but nevertheless is not completely observant, then if they are born of, or their ancestry is that of a woman who has converted to Judaism, their Jewishness can be retroactively annulled. So in theory, and this is a major fight in the Knesset now, in theory, anyone who has converted to Judaism under the aegis of Rabbi Druckmann, their conversion, their status as Jews can be challenged. In recent years, there has been a rabbi named Chaim Amsalem who is a Shas, member of the Knesset. He comes from a Moroccan Jewish family. He is a great rabbinic scholar. He has been expelled from the Shas, the Sephardic party. He took a couple of stances that made him quite controversial. One, he said that uh, military exemption should not be given to all yeshiva students who so desire it, and they should not be supported by the state, but they should go out and get a job and go to work. Uh, for that, he was expelled. But he also wrote a book entitled Zera Yisrael because his concern, the seed of Israel, was his concern is that in a state where you have 500,000 people who in effect live as Jews but are not afforded the basic right of being able to be married, divorced, or buried in the Jewish state, that that's an intolerable situation. Consequently, he has taken the stance that children born of Jewish fathers and non-Jewish mothers who live in Israel, based on any number of Talmudic sources, including the Talmud Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud, where it says 
in Masechet Gerim, a tractate in regard to conversion, Eretz Yisrael Machsheret Gerim, that the land of Israel is appropriate for people who wish to convert. He says these children are Zerah Yisrael. They are literally Zerah Kodesh. They are holy offspring. His conception of Jewish peoplehood goes beyond a simple observance of mitzvot, that people who live in the Jewish state, who live as Jews in the Jewish state, who fight in the Jewish army, who raise their children as Hebrew speakers, and who identify as Jews, he accords them status as Jews as well, and is prepared to convert them immediately to Judaism. It is unclear if Rabbi Amsalem's position, and he has created a new ultra-Orthodox party, Am Shalem, will ultimately uh, gain hegemony or even a significant political force in the Jewish state, but he is an halachic scholar to be reckoned with. In any event, in just concluding my remarks tonight, I want you to understand that while, of course, when we're talking about issues of existence, when Israel has to face the challenges of Hamas and others, we talk clearly about matters of life and death. But to the degree that the state of Israel ultimately has to also embody the concerns and hopes and aspirations of the entirety of the Jewish people, both within the state of Israel and for those of us who live worldwide, this issue of conversion, this notion of Jewish status and identity and the conceptions of peoplehood that emerge from this internal Jewish controversy within the Jewish state will say a great deal about what the directions of the state of Israel will be in years to come. I thank you for listening to this tonight and look forward to our questions and answers now. Dr. Ellenson, great talk. I'm just, oh, okay, oh, Rabbi Chavivi, yes, I know you. <laughs> so my question is about Jewish peoplehood and why are rabbis the only gatekeepers to Jewish peoplehood? If the state of Israel is in large part a secular state, right. so you've said that, that non-Jews can gain or sort of Jews can gain citizenship. So yeah. that's a part of Jewish peoplehood. Outside of Israel, have there ever been attempts, or do you foresee any attempts to have gates for people joining the Jewish people that do not involve the rabbinate or religion? Yeah, I, I think the difference, though, in relate, did every, everyone heard that, right? He's got a microphone. Mm -hmm. The difference outside the state of Israel is that the state doesn't actually enforce these kinds of issues. So when I, uh, Outside the state of Israel, there can certainly be debates, arguments. Uh, there are practical ways in which people participate in the Jewish people. If one were to look at fights today over issues of intermarriage, patrilineality within, uh, within the Jewish world, uh, and the example I gave for ex of Mr. Goldenberg in New Orleans, the Moyle who did perform the circumcision, uh, I can speak as a reform rabbi for a moment. I simply try to engage in what I would call uh, no deception when I engage in conversion, namely what I would say to individuals when they come to me as a reform rabbi, and Rabbi Friedman and others may have different approaches. Uh, I would usually say to an individual at a certain point, well, look, there's also a gigantic advantage. I I've been a professor my whole life. I actually, <laughs> I actually never deal with Jews outside of the academy or my uh, <laughs> students. I don't know what it's like at Duke Law School or Chapel Hill or in medical school. I don't think, Wally, it's quite this way. But in rabbinical school, one thing we do attempt to do is that we hope that the people who teach for us have very little, if no, practical experience. Because <laughs> one of the great advantages that it affords us is that we're able to see how it is the Jewish people ought to live and reality need never conflict with our uh, <laughs> insights. By the way, every friend of mine, do we have any law professors here? 
Every friend of mine who teaches in a law school, and you may be the exception, a couple of them have never even taken a bar examination. One of our mutual friends who's professor of property law at USC had an issue once. She ended up calling my brother. And my brother said, aren't you a graduate of Harvard Law School? And she said, yes, and then went on to say, and don't you teach property law? And she said, yes. Said, you know, this is really a pretty simple question. She wanted to know who to sue. My brother said, sue everybody. That was his, <laughs> that was his advice to her. But she's never taken a bar exam, though she clerked for a Supreme Court justice. But she teaches law. Similarly, in rabbinical schools, keep in mind, as I'm about to give your answer, I have minimal kinds of experiences. I would bet you convert or marry more people in two months than I've probably done in 35 years. Rabbi Lieber may be in a different uh, position than I am. But th the point I would make is that when I engage, I would say as a liberal rabbi, if the person I convert goes to the mikvah, has brit milah, I would say to them, you should know that your conversion would be accepted as valid and legitimate by all non-Orthodox rabbis probably everywhere in the world. You could make aliyah, as I've explained. The one group that would not accept a conversion I would perform as valid with mikvah and ritual circumcision would be the Orthodox. And the person can either live with that or not. I mean, I try to be honest in my presentation. One has to also keep in mind, you have individuals, I'm sure, in communities who uh, belong to federations, serve on the board of Jewish Family Service, et cetera. Part of the reason why we have debates over demographic counting in North America, do we have 5 million Jews, 8 million Jews? It all depends, again, how you view Jewishness. Uh, I have a cousin who lives here in Carolina. Uh, her husband's non-Jewish. They've sent their children to a Chabad day school in Greensboro. The wife is Jewish. The husband is not. Uh, the husband belongs. He's on the board of Jewish Family Service. He goes to synagogue every week. I asked him why he did that. He said, well, I like the rabbi, Judy Schindler. She has something interesting to say. The one thing he has not done is formally convert to Judaism. When I asked him why, given how they lead their lives, he said, well, I'm not religious. I think, by the way, he has a certain view of religion that isn't consonant completely with the peoplehood sort of view. And who knows, maybe one day he will formally convert. Is he Jewish or not Jewish? Who's the gatekeeper? The Federation certainly has him sit on the board. They don't, or at least the Board of Jewish Family Service, they don't seem to have any problem with it. I think issues of identity, et cetera, are uh, highly complex. The reason why it becomes more of a problem in Israel is you don't really have volunteerism than in regard to what you might call, or I would call, basic civil rights, the right to engage in these areas of personal status. And that's why in Israel it becomes uh, much more problematic. By the way, I should tell you that last year in surveys, over 1,400 couples were married in the state of Israel, uh, not by the Rabbanut. Uh, that is to say, as a kind of form of, I would even call it, civil protest, because they don't want the rabbinate to control it. And in many instances, these people have, uh, it's two Jewish people who could be married in the state of Israel. They go to reform or conservative rabbis. They ask them to officiate at their weddings. But the state doesn't actually formally recognize uh, these marriages. By the way, keep in mind, with the Ben-Gurion children, I'll call them, they were able to live in Israel. They paid taxes. They, the daughter only had a problem when it came time to be married. So I think the issue, to some degree, is when do these matters come up? I would imagine that in Greensboro, you have people belonging to different synagogues where the status as Jews might or might not be recognized by various rabbis. But my bet is when you have a program at Federation or at the JCC, the rabbis never bring it up and people participate because the reality is unless there's going to be marriage and aliyah of the Torah, et cetera, whatever it might be, there's no need to, uh, there's no need for this kind of controversy to necessarily, uh, necessarily arise. Um, I heard a very interesting talk this morning about the progressive movement in Poland 
And the rabbi who spoke said that they are approached not infrequently by a person who has learned for the first time that he was born of a Jewish mother who hid the right. child with a Christian family. Now, the Orthodox movement in Poland will not convert this person, and will not accept this person, I should say, unless he has written documentation, right. just like the insurance companies wouldn't accept the, the claim without a death certificate. And of course, there is no such thing. So it prompts the question, does this arise in Israel? This is a completely separate problem from what you discussed, where the child is not born of a Jewish mother, and then there are conversion problems. But this is a child born of a Jewish yes. mother who has to prove it. And so I'm wondering, how do they prove it? Do they, does each person in Israel have to prove at the time of marriage or burial that they are born of a Jewish mother, and how is this done? Well, I have heard it has come up a great deal in regard to uh, marriage, particularly if people are not born in Israel where there cannot be testimony assuring their Jewishness. If an American Jew, for example, were to make Aliyah and desire to be married in Israel, not even dealing with a Polish child who discovers matrilineal descent, they do have to, in quotes, in quotes generally prove they're Jewish. This is usually done by, uh, the, the best way to do it is to have a document in which the ancestors matrilineally, uh, a ketubah, have been married by an Orthodox rabbi. That's usually one way in which Jewishness can be established. The other is, in general, uh, the Orthodox rabbinate wants the testimony of Orthodox rabbis whom they trust in America to indicate the Jewishness of the, uh, of the individual, which would mean that, generally speaking, no one in the Israeli rabbinate will accept the testimony of uh, non-Orthodox rabbis for this purpose. It can mean that it's very, very difficult uh, in Israel uh, to obtain marriage licenses, even for persons born of two Jewish parents, without some kind of connection to an Orthodox rabbi who uh, can attest to the Jewishness of the candidate. And again, Rabbi Friedman and Rabbi Havivi may have practical experience. My own sense anecdotally of this is that most reforming conservative rabbis do usually have a friend who's an Orthodox rabbi, <laughs> seriously, who will in fact send a letter over when one of their congregants or someone they know is involved and where they will certify to their friend that the person is genuinely Jewish. I'm just turning to both of you. Is that, in fact, what? Well, in addition to, it's not that these chief rabbis sort of sit at the desk of the marriage bureau and check. There, there are clerks who do They're the clerks. charities. Yes. So a, a lot of this has to do it, and there are many members of my congregation who made Aliyah and get married, and they and it's sort of a, a little bit of a crapshoot. That is, yes. if the clerk has had a fight with his wife that morning at breakfast, he'll be in a bad mood and he'll sort of want to check. If he's in a better mood, then, you know, if there's a letter from Beth David Synagogue in Greensboro, some guy named Habibi that, you know, said, yes, he's Jewish and I know his mother is Jewish, that's good enough for him. So there's a, a haphazardness to the... Yes, I think that's fight. true. Rabbi Friedman, you want to add anything? Yeah. Ditto. Okay. That was eloquent. <laughs> rabbi Friedman's not genuinely a rabbi. You know, what I want to say is <laughs> that in general, everything can be said, but most rabbis don't feel that they've said it. Uh, so I really admire you for that uh, discretion. That's good. That doesn't usually preclude most of us from adding, though. <laughs> Yeah, you may already have answered the question with your last response, but I'm the, um, and so this is the personalizer, but it's a more general question. I'm the child of uh, immigrants from Lithuania, right. both of whom have passed. So I arrive in Israel, and I say, I'm Jewish, and I want to avail myself of well, all the services, but in addition, uh, I am married now, but <laughs> if I wanted to prove I were Jewish, how would I do it, except to get that clerk on the good day? Well, I think, look, under the law of return, there probably would not be any problem. In terms of marriage, divorce, burial, you would have a challenge. You would have to have someone 
to write some kind of letter. There'd have to be some genealogical study, unless you got the clerk on the right day who just took your word. But anecdotally, again, my impression is that that happens less than the need to be able to demonstrate slash prove this. But you might get lucky. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. This is a follow-up to the, orig the question before this. Um, if this man in, um, who's, who was given to a Christian mother um, had a document saying that the Nazis killed her in Auschwitz, that would not count with the rabbis, even though she died because she was Jewish? I mean, on some level, does, does our, our history transcend um, I guess. I think part of, yes, I, I think what you're saying here is can people use, my fathers used to say tachas, uh, <laughs> meaning use a little bit of seichel. Uh, there are many rabbis who would undoubtedly be compassionate in such a case, but if you're, the, the problem is the direction of this law or the interpretation of it has over the last few years become more and more extreme. And the reason why it's become a greater issue on the Israeli political scene is that you now have, give or take, 10% of the Jewish population in a sociological sense in Israel have doubtful halakhic status. There are individual cases, someone from Durham, Greensboro, Charlotte who converts may have an issue. Numbers-wise, it's not I, I want to be clear about this. From a personal standpoint, it, it's infinitely significant. From a political standpoint, it's not infinitely significant. And part of why the state of Israel has tolerated this all these years is that, one, you have the need for coalition politics. And two, because it hasn't really impacted that many people. It is now beginning to impact them. The writings of Rabbi Amsalem have been motivated by the fact that you now have hundreds of thousands of people who fall into this category. And a couple of years ago, you may remember, there was a Haver Knesset, a member of the Knesset named Rotem, who wanted to resolve this through a bill that he proposed to the Knesset, that bill had a lot of problems with it, so that many of us felt the solution, again, was worse than the problem it attempted to cure. But his desire to provide full enfranchisement for all of these people in the state of Israel is something that's surely understandable. Look, from an historian's point of view, this would be the other point I'd make. When Laura kindly read uh, the introduction to all of these uh, fascinating bestsellers that I've written, um, my actual field of academic expertise is the development of Orthodox Judaism in the 19th century in Germany. I could almost say I know more about it than anyone in North America, because there are only about two others of us who have studied. Uh, I mentioned to Laura once, who wrote a really wonderful book last year on a classical rabbinic text. I gave it to a very good friend of mine who's a Duke University alumnus. I'll say it's a rather technical book. The alumnus was proud that a professor at Duke had written this book, but returned it to me and said, there may be someone else who can understand this uh, <laughs> better than I can. Uh, when I wrote some of my first books, my mother, uh, looked at the first paragraph or two and said, a lot of people don't read this, do they? Uh, <laughs> and I said, no, a lot of people don't. But if you are interested in the topic of the reaction of the Hungarian Orthodox rabbinate to apostasy in the 1860s, you will read this forever. <laughs> Because it's unlikely there's going to be another article on this topic. It's not like writing about Shakespeare. But in the 1840s, when the reform movement began, and this is how I would respond to a lot of these questions, you had a group of Orthodox rabbis in Central Europe who simply wanted to define all non-Orthodox Jews as being non-Jewish. That was a way to handle incipient religious sectarianism. 
just to find these people as outside of your community. But they were hoisted, as it were, on their own petard. And one of my teachers, the greatest historian of Judaism in the modern period, Professor Yaakov Katz, who taught at the Hebrew University, in his book, Out of the Ghetto, Social Emancipation and the Jews, 1770 to 1870, has a brilliant chapter entitled Conservatives in a Quandary. He doesn't mean conservative Jews. He means Jews who are religiously conservative. And their quandary was this. They didn't know how to deal with deviance, with deviance, with other expressions of Jewishness that didn't comport completely to their own traditionalist way of being in the world. And they wanted to resolve it by just defining everyone who was deviant as being outside of the community. But Professor Katz points out, and this was their quandary, they were hoisted on their own petard. They were hoisted because as people committed to Jewish law, there is a line in the Talmud, Yisrael afa pisha chata Yisrael hu. A Jew, even when a Jew sins, remains a Jew. And the overwhelming preponderance of rabbinic authorities from the medieval sage Rashi all the way to the present day have basically reaffirmed the notion that Judaism has a birth dogma. If you were born of a Jewish mother, you may have a hard time proving it. That's a completely other issue. You cannot write these people out of the Jewish people. But I bring this up because what's interesting is in the 1840s, the rabbinate did not move in that direction, nor did they have the political power. The irony in Israel, and this is the real dilemma, and Ailey, when I think about the question you asked earlier, it is not that you can't have other gatekeepers or issues in North America, but in a voluntaristic community that lacks coercive political authority, it's a matter of choice on all sorts of people's parts in all sorts of areas of their life. But what has happened in the state of Israel because of coalition politics is that there is a group of rabbis who represent, and now I'm really reflecting my own views, I wouldn't even call these the most stringent interpretations of Jewish law in Jewish history. They've invented interpretations of Jewish law, quite frankly. And in my opinion, now I'm really moving from being an academic to being, quite frankly, a partisan. They have taken stances that I think are, quite frankly, cruel in relationship to any number of people in according them basic civil rights. But the irony in terms of Jewish peoplehood is that the very creation of the state of Israel with its political apparatus has allowed this to emerge in a way that in a diasporan Jewish world that lacks communal cohesion and political autonomy in a way that's virtually unprecedented in the history of the Jews and why I think history will ultimately be on the side of an orthodox rabbi like Rabbi Amsalam who calls such people Zerah Kodesh, Zerah Yisrael, Holy Seed, the Seed of Israel is that in the end, I do not know how a state, a Jewish state, can deny a significant minority of its population these basic rights if you have any conception of Jewish peoplehood that extends beyond the most narrow halachic definition of status. Sometimes when I talk on this issue, and again, I will confess, because Danny Gordis and I just finished this book I haven't even given you a thousandth, and I won't, of the sources that we looked at. It, it frankly saddens me because I will now make an additional confession. Zionism is the very center of my life and my being. I've lived in Israel any number of years. I love speaking Hebrew. I love these texts. I love Medina Israel. I think the state of Israel represents the greatest renaissance and miracle of Jewish rebirth in 2,000 years of Jewish history. And frankly, on this issue, it simply saddens me that the conception of Jewish peoplehood that this ultra-Orthodox rabbinate, and even only a dimension of that rabbinate, but the group that is charged with authority by the Jewish state on this issue, has such a constricted status definition of Jewishness and acts out in these instances of how one would uh, engage in proof in ways that are uh, 
disheartening to me. So maybe one or two last questions. Mr. Rudnick, you certainly get to ask. Well, you touched on uh, part of what my question was going to be. Uh, it almost seems like most of this is really a subset of whether you know, the future of Judaism and the Jewish people should be one of inclusiveness or exclusiveness. And uh, there are cases made very strongly on both sides. Um, you know, I'm on the side of inclusiveness. Right. But, uh, you know, that seems to be the basic issue. You know, is it going to be a hardcore group of small, smaller group of people? Or is Judaism going to follow the path of some other religions where they try to increase their size by being inclusive in their religion? Yeah. I mean, no, I think it's a very good point. Listen, uh, I tend to be on the side of wanting to be inclusive myself. I mean, I'll be the first to, uh, to admit that. When we talk about these, uh, these issues, one needs to remember, if we're talking about it in Israel in particular, you do have rabbis like Rabbi Amsalem, Rabbi Unterman, Rabbi Gorin. What is interesting, and in the book we discuss this, you uh, can read it along with my mother. Uh, <laughs> the chief rabbis of Israel, Rabbi Herzog, Rabbi Unterman, Rabbi Uziel, Rabbi Gorin, tended to be very, very broad and inclusive. They had to issue rulings on this issue for the totality of the Jewish people. Consequently, and here I would mention an essay written by a former teacher of mine, passed away several years ago, Charles Liebman, who taught at Yeshiva University in Bar Ilan, published an article in the Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion in March of 1983. It's entitled Extremism as a Religious Norm. And this is the thesis Professor Lieberman put forward. Liebman put forward. He said that in the Middle Ages, while rabbis tended to be pious personally, by the way, I have no expertise in this, so again, it's easy for me not to be confused by too much data. But <laughs> Liebman, well, I find the more I know about things, it's usually a little more complex and layered. But Liebman's thesis was that while rabbis may have been personally stringent, because they ruled for an entire community, they tended to be lenient in rulings on matters like this. With the advent of modernity and emancipation and the collapse of the political structure of the community where reform, conservative, orthodox, Zionist, reconstructionist forms of Judaism emerged, people were able to make Shabbos, as it were, for themselves. So if the reform movement wants to take a stance on patrilineality and consider children born of non-Jewish mothers and Jewish fathers Jewish who were raised Jewishly. Traditionalist elements in the community may or may not like it, but the reform movement can move in that direction. The thesis is important because if you look at the writings of many of the halakhic authorities in Israel prior to the 21st century, they tended to be very lenient and inclusive on these issues because they recognized in their own sense of Jewish peoplehood that someone who comes to live in the state of Israel, speaks Hebrew, serves in the Israeli army, socializes among Jews, is part of the Jewish, is part of the destiny and fate of the Jewish people. And consequently, they ruled accordingly. Rabbi Gorin, by the way, ironically, in all the conversion certificates he issued, said these conversions are valid only in the state of Israel. And again, he based it on the passage in Masechet Gerim, Eretz Yisrael Machsheret Gerim. Eretz Yisrael is appropriate for converts. His reasoning was, while in the diaspora, a person might convert, but not really live a Jewish life among Jewish people. That's impossible in Israel. But that's also because his conception of Jewish peoplehood involves secularists living in Tel Aviv as well as religious observers living in Mea Sha'arim. His conception of Jewish peoplehood was broad enough to include all of these people. What's interesting is that the chief rabbinate in Israel today, or the people who were charged with enforcing these laws, don't take this kind of stance. And the reason why I think history will ultimately not be on their side is that 
Unlike the first chief rabbis who realized what the totality of Jewish life was, these people's views simply are too narrowly constricted. And I do wonder what the ultimate impact will be uh, the ultimate impact will be on political alliances in the Jewish state, because here, the domestic Jewish interests of the party that Foreign Minister Lieberman represents run completely counter to the foreign policy elements that cause him to coalesce with some of these ultra-Orthodox parties at this moment. So it will be interesting to see. This is a potential point of conflict. Maybe the last comment I'll make, because uh, I presume, well, I know you could listen to my mellifluous tones for uh, much, much longer, uh, and I'd be happy to discuss this later. Look, my own hope, and I guess I would say this, attitudes taken by Jews on these issues really do touch on this inclusion I don't know what the other word is, exclusive kind of poll. And uh, my own inclination is to view Jewish peoplehood in a broad, broad sense. By the way, it is interesting to note that conversion itself in Jewish law doesn't even have to be conducted under the aegis of rabbis. You can have, according to halakha, shalosh had yotot, you can have three knowledgeable common lay people who would serve on a bet din for purposes of conversion, though in practice the reality is rabbis uh, tend to preside over these things. But I want to just end then with my favorite response um, uh, of Rabbi Kalisher's, who I mentioned earlier, and I think it does tie into Israel. Again, as I said, in the 1860s when the New Orleans Jewish community was fighting over this issue, the head rabbi was a man named Bernard Illoway. He served uh, seven communities in 19 years. There are two ways to explain it. One is that he really didn't get along very well wherever he was. I like to think that his Torah was so great that one community couldn't be contained by him, and other communities clearly wanted him uh, soon afterwards. I'll let you judge which explanation is uh, probably more plausible for uh, seven places in 19 years. He never got tenure. Uh, never mind. That's, that's another part of my job. Uh, so this Rabbi Illoui, when he refused to allow these children to be converted, wrote to rabbis in Europe to get their opinions. And the rabbi I liked the best in this was, because he agrees with my stance, uh, was a rabbi named Svi Hirsch Kalisher. Kalisher lived from 1795 to 1874. He was a chadmeim of Asrei Zion. He was a forerunner of Zionism. And he wrote a book, Drishat Zion, Seeking Zion, that justified Zionism from a traditional religious standpoint, as opposed to most Orthodox rabbis who were opposed to Zionism because they felt that God should return the Jewish people to the land of Israel in a supernatural manner. Rabbi Kalisher rejected that notion. He quoted a line, Shuvu Elayv Ashuva Aleichem, you return to me and I will return to you. He said that Israel, the rebirth of the Jewish state, would not occur in a miraculous moment, but the Jews were called upon to aid God in the task, as it were, of having the Jewish people return to the land of Israel. He was asked, should these children born of non-Jewish mothers and Jewish fathers be brought into the community when the non-Jewish mother acceded to the request to have these children have a circumcision and ritual immersion ceremony? And he said that such children, he defined them as Zerah Kodesh. They are literally holy seed, holy offspring. By the way, Rabbi Amsalam rests on this tshuva in his own approach to this question. But he has two great, great lines that I do always try to keep in mind every single day. I will say not just in regard to the issue of conversion or Israel, but I try to think about it when I teach and when I meet individuals, and I hope I'm able to transmit it to my students. He says first about the children, the line I quoted earlier. He said, bring the children in, there's Zera Kodesh, because he said, who knows? Yisrael. How do you know great people may emerge from these people, from these children? 
And I try to say to my students, you never know who you're teaching or whose life you're touching. I mean, I went to the College of William and Mary. I did my master's at Virginia. I hardly would fall into that realm. William and Mary is the College of Presidents, but it did not mean the president of Hebrew Union College. They had other <laughs> presidents in mind. And I don't know when James Livingston taught me religion there, if he ever would have imagined that a president of Hebrew Union College would emerge from there. I can't say I thought about it at that point either. Uh, if I'd gone to Arkansas, I might have felt differently, which is <laughs> Dr. Lieber's uh, alma mater. And the other line is he says, well, what about the fathers. Remember, as an Orthodox rabbi, he was opposed to intermarriage. But he said, you know, in this case, what the fathers want to do is good. They want to bring the children into the Jewish community. And he says, lifamim afilu poshe Yisrael asim mitzvot karimon. Sometimes even people who do bad things, which is how he regarded intermarriage, are able to perform good deeds that are as plentiful in the world as the seeds of a pomegranate. Human beings are flawed. We make mistakes. The ability we have and the limitations imposed upon us by our finitude are virtually infinite. And we do and make mistakes almost every day. But sometimes people, even who do bad things on other occasions, are capable of being little lower than the angels. And I hope that my students and the people I encounter that I attempt to remember each day that regardless of how they behave, let's say the day before, or what they might even do the day after, are capable at a certain moment of doing great and good things. When Judah Golden was first brought here 70 years ago to start teaching Jewish studies at the Divinity School and at the university, who would know that 40 years later, not even 40 years later, 30 years, 25 years later, we'd have the Myers come and that uh, Duke University, along with the University of North Carolina, uh, <laughs> would develop into a great center of Jewish studies and Jewish learning uh, in North America and throughout the world. And so uh, I am very, very honored that uh, you've invited me to be here tonight. Uh, it's been a great, great pleasure to talk with you, and I hope that on this night of uh, Hanukkah, you will continue to be elevated in holiness and that you'll move from strength to strength. So thank you very much. This was truly a feast for the mind and for the heart, and now we invite everyone to feast on some food and s some other beautiful things for the eyes. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.